Thank you for joining everyone. We'll get started in just a few minutes here. Okay, 340 participants. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, hello and welcome from the snowy Midwest to the third installment of the COVID-19 webinar series hosted by the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force. The Joint COVID-19 Task Force is comprised by representatives of the American Society of Extracorporeal Technology, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the American Academy of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the Association Latinoamericana de Perfusion, the Australian and New Zealand College of Perfusionists, the Canadian Society of Clinical Perfusionists, Comprehensive Care Services, the European Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion, the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons Quality Collaborative, Perfusion.com, Specialty Care, Tiny Perfusion Letter, and Vivacity Perfusion. In this webinar, we're gonna be hearing from Mr. Haz Mohammed, CCP, who's Chief Perfusionist at Advent Health Waterman out of Tavares, Florida. He's gonna be discussing the COVID-19 experience at Advent Health at his hospital. We're gonna be hearing from Mike Freed, who's the Chief Perfusionist at Henry Ford in Detroit. Uh, regarding staff deployment during case reduction. And finally, we're gonna hear from Linda Mangero, CCP Emeritus, who's Vice President ECLS ECMO for Specialty Care, and she's based out of Nashville, Tennessee. She's gonna be discussing diagnosis and management of cytokine storm, which is very timely given the uh, Cytosorb webinar that was hosted this morning by the company that makes Cytosorb. As a panelist, we have Mr. Joseph G. Tempa, CCP FPP, who's manager of ECMO and, and of perfusion and ECMO at Children's Hospital of Alabama. 
out of Hoover, Alabama. I'm Don Nieder. I'm CCP Emeritus, the Perform Quality Initiatives Co Coordinator. I work for the Michigan Society of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgeons Quality Collaborative out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is a mouth load when you have to answer the phone. And Carla Mall, CCP, Clinical Manager for Perfusion.com. She's based out of New Orleans, but right now she's in Tavares, Florida, sitting ECMO for Mr. Muhammad. We'll be recording today's broadcast to allow for future playback. And after presentations from Haas, Mike, and Linda, we will have a Q&A session. So please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom presentation window to submit any questions you have during the presentation. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Um, Carla is taking the responsibility. She might have, to, you might not get your question answered directly, but she's gonna to try to co collate them. Um, and answer them topically if possible. If we're unab unable to get to your question, please consider using the Joint COVID-19 Task Force Discussion Forum through the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force website to submit your questions. Members of the task force are monitoring the discussion forum continually and we're working to respond to as many questions as possible. Just a note, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion has approved the Joint Perfusion COVID-19 Task Force to offer up to 1.2 Category 1 CE units for attendees to the live broadcast. We'll email a survey to all individuals on the live broadcast within a day of the live broadcast to claim your credits. And then we'll send off certificates to all attendees within three or four weeks of the broadcast. I just wanted to mention before we get started that we chose our speakers this week based primarily on feedback we'd previous re previously received from attendees. Uh, one recurring topic was how are perfusion groups managing all the responsibility in this time of dramatically decreased caseload, given the very real possibility of furloughs and layoffs. Hospitals are in a tough situation that they're revenue depleted, but they need to keep staff on and available for the projected pent-up demand for surgical services once we go to some realm of normalcy again after this is all over. And another frequently mentioned topic was the cytokine eliminating technologies and uh, techniques, which I think kind of segues well with the concept of perfusion workforce concerns since it provides an additional opportunity for perfusionists to continue to use their knowledge and skills to genuinely help the sickest of the patients affected by COVID-19. So I'd like to start today with Mr. Haz Mohammed, CCP, Chief of Perfusionist at Advent Health. Thank you, Don. Um, good morning and welcome to all our participants. Um, I'm Haz Mohammed. I'm the Chief of Perfusionist of Florida Hospital Waterman in the middle of Florida, in Tavares, Florida. I work for perfusion.com. And um, I was just joined by Carla who came in to help us because we had a big slamming of ECMO or COVID ECMO versus our normal ECMO. So I'm gonna give a preamble about what's going on here with respect to our COVID ECMO and then I'll speak to the fact of what we do a little differently as Carla has noticed. And that's why she asked me to give this talk. Um, we were going along fine with normal ECMOs just before the COVID situation arose at our hospital. We had three ECMOs on, on one side of the hospital. Our hospital is very unique. Florida Hospital Waterman is one of the 10 best constructed hospitals in the United States of America. That's the record we have. Many people come from all over the world to look at this hospital and how it was constructed. And this hostel is so every floor is shaped like a clover leaf. And the front of the hostel is designed like the Denver Airport. And it's an amazing structure, it's fascinating. I still get lost in it and people think I'm not on my medication properly. So I still get lost after five years. It's just a fascinating structure. But as we were going along in the normal ECMO patients, everybody is in and out of the rooms and it's fine. And we were in one location. And as, can, as the clover leaf says, you're designed in pods. And People are all over the floor and then the pods can communicate and then there's their are walls or areas or real estate between the pods and you can't see each other. Hence what happened to us. 
we had normal ECMOs on one side and then the COVID patients hit us. And we could not see those patients in the other side of pods created for them. So we had a major dilemma of staffing. We could not go from one side to the other because we will be getting contamination or cross-contamination taking place on a regular basis. We were only three and a half staff members. And what had happened there is that with a cardiac operating room running night and day, uh, with cases not sort of uh, decreased in numbers when the COVID uh, experience took place, we were caught in a staff depleted problem. And um, it was hard to, to manage because we had normal patients and COVID patients on ECMO. So it was a logistical nightmare. So our surgeons, we got together with them and we, we talked about it. And my people in perfusion.com, I talked to them and they sprung me some help and it was great. And then finally, we got a lot of help when we moved from all normal ECMOs to all COVID ECMOs. And that's where the dilemma got even worse. Although we were on one side of the pod, looking after only COVID patients. We found a lot of problems going on with that whole situation. We had enough staff to cover them, but what happened is that most of the care was almost done out of the room. We found that people were reporting like nursing will be inside of each room and they'll be reporting to the perfusionists out of the room because we were moving in and out of like three rooms or three rooms at one time. And, and so there was a delay in getting into the rooms. And that was an, a real big dilemma for me. I, when patients need care, they need it right away. So we waited on a signal from the nurse who will tell us what's going on or they need a blood gas done, they'll hand us the blood gas and we will do it on an ACT together with that. And then that'll be transferred back as results back to that nurse into that room. Uh, alarms were going off. There was a delay in response to those alarms, and that was another dilemma for us. PPE was abundant at one time, and then it got scarce. It was shared, and there's no question that's happening across the country. So that was another nightmare moving from one room to the other with the same PPE e equipment. Um, stress levels were extremely high among all personnel i.e. The, the nurses, perfusionists, PAs, and all, every attendee, surgeons, everyone. Uh, there was great major anxiety level that, that we noticed in everyone. And no employee here was tested that I know of for, for um, uh, COVID-19. And I don't think anyone has seen hazard pay, which is something being raised across the country. Uh, so, so, so the whole thing brought up uh, a definite entity which is called psychological trauma to employees. We have a situation here where a CRNA who works with the COVID patients in the operating room has a wife who works in the cardiovascular intensive care units with COVID patients and they have two small children at home. And it's amazing every day they go home and it's a nightmare because they don't know what's going to happen. So our geographical distribution of our patients was a major problem to start with. Uh, and it was the normal patients versus the COVID patient. Today, we are all on the COVID side and um, we're handling it decently well, thanks to the help of Carla and colleagues of hers who have come into town to help us out with respect to the staffing because our ORs are still running. Uh, we're not doing as many cases as we used to, but we are doing some cases. And um, they do present a problem and we have to manage those cases in the operating room and then manage the COVID patients, which takes an enormous amount of time. So that's my preamble to what is going on with our COVID patients when it comes to handling them. But what Carla wanted me to talk about more so is that she noticed some different, I guess, treatment and modalities that occur at our place and she would like me to address them. And I'd like to address them too, because I've spoken to about 50 or 60% of the country when it comes to how they're managing COVID. And we do some different things as compared to those people, including Canada. Um, so I'm gonna allude to that right now. And the first one is all of our ECMOs are put in the operating room. Every one of them 
are taken to the operating room, the cardiovascular, uh, surgical suite, and one room is dedicated definitely for COVID patients. Um, the, the cannulation is done on the fluoro, anesthesia, TE, and as I said, we have a dedicated COVID room. Um, everything is handled accordingly when it comes to decontamination after that patient is taken out of that room, including, including um, our pump, which is established in that room. We, we actually remove them before we do a COVID patient. Now, that is a problem for us because we don't like that to take the pumps out. I had a case last year where a patient came into the operating room to get cannulated, and before he was cannulated, he actually um, arrested and had to go and bypass. We put a patient in bypass, looked after him, and then basically cannulated him for ECMO. So he was brought in for ECMO, put on bypass to, to actually rescue him, and then convert him back to ECMO. So I get a little nervous when our pump is out of the room, but we do it just because we don't want to have to pump in the room. <clears throat> um, the other thing that is different here is that we, um, we do bronchoscopies on all of our patients every day. They're done as early as possible in the morning so that we can continue to our care uh, during the day and get enough time. We do not let bronchoscopies lag all day. It's taken an entire day to get, to get the procedure done. And it is done with the perfusionist there, the intensivist who's going to do it, respiratory, and the critical care nurse who's taking care of that patient. Uh, these patients definitely, um, obviously because of the of the spread, of the potential spread of the COVID um, virus because of aerosol droplets, um, the tracheostomy tube, um, when they're disconnected from the ventilator, the ventilator is turned off and put on a pause uh, so they don't blurt out gases on the inspiratory line, which is full of fluid and condensation, which can get into people's faces. And that has happened to one of our perfusionists a while back. And so those patients are covered the bronch bronchoscopy um, device is introduced and uh, saline, mucomist, and the rest of it is spread into the airways and they're suctioned out. Now, the bronchoscopy procedure at our place is a little unique also. We have these patients bagged up by the respiratory therapist. That is, after they're bronched, what happens during a bronchoscopy is what the discussion is about. When you bronch a patient, you ex actually take out a lot of gas out of the airways, and their distal airways collapses. They all collapse, and some more so than the other, depending on the elastins and compliance. But we take out all of the gas, and then we expect these patients to be re-expanded suddenly because we put them back on the ventilator. Absolutely wrong. If you look at West and Nunn and these guys, they talk about that. We tend to put patients on 100% oxygen, and then when they're, when they're put back on, on the ventilator that way and we walk away, we find most of our patients were decompensating while they were in ECMO. They got worse after the bronch. They got terribly worse. First of all, there's a lot of fluid in the airways from, from the saline installations. And the second problem is that these airways, because blood is passing through the capillary areas, uh, distal to the alveoli, they suck up all the oxygen, which is 100% oxygen in the airways, and these areas collapse and they have what you call absorption atelectasis. So what we do, we bag these patients up probably in 40% or 30% oxygen to get some nitrogen in those airways to splint them. We can bag them up with 100% oxygen and then go to 40% or 30% of FiO2 so we can get nitrogen in those airways to splint them so we can re-expand or what you call recoup those airways. And that's very important. And we've seen very good results with that. So that's the first thing we do, daily bronchs. And we, we have an art of bronching them and basically just salvaging those airways to stay patent as such, they're just the airways. And it's called recruitment. Tracheostomies are done probably within the second day or the third day of those patients being in the hospital for COVID ECMO. We try to get tracheostomies done as early as possible for management of the airways and potential aspiration, all that being avoided, especially within the tracheal tube. 
which the cuffs get warm and they tend to leak and you have secretions passing down into the airways and hence you get a reinfection. We get daily chest x-rays on these patients and they're compared to the days before and they're looked at in, in very critical forms. And we, we use those as gauges towards whether they're getting better or not. We have daily renal assessments when indicated. All these patients are seen by the renal people that, concerning their kidney functions. And uh, we do a lot of CRRT in our patients and stuffing with a hemoconcentrator. And at our institution, we made some, some special fittings to go into hemoconcentrators where we can scuff by attaching an IV pump into the, into the hemoconcentrator and taking off exactly what we want rather than ballparking things. So if we're giving 500 cc's of fluid draw via IVs, we can, and we want to take off 100 extra, we set an IV pump at 600 cc's to extract from the hemoconcentrators. So we know precisely what we're giving and what we're taking off. Uh, we've also added another custom fitting at the bottom. If the CRRT people are not available or they're very busy, and we have many machines running, we can do the poor man's CRT. That is, we use a dialysis from them and count the current to the blood flow. We just pass those fluids right through there and uh, there's definitely electrolyte uh, exchange and the patient is actually getting a poor man's CRT as compared to the big machines that from Prism and all of them being in the room. So we can do that. Then again, we attach several other IV pumps because Sometimes the infusion rate of those solutions are about a liter. So we have to take off 1,100 now. These pumps go up to 999. They don't go up to a liter or 1,100. So we have to attach another IV pump. So that's where we're a little different, but we do that very aggressively and we make sure that these patients are not floating in tons of extravascular water because it really bogs down their pulmonary system and they don't do well. We also, for anticoagulation, use angiomax. We do not use heparin at all. It may be used in the operating room, but as soon as they get up to the unit, we wait until the heparin, uh, the ACTs sort of subsides down to the like 140, 120, 130 seconds, and angiomax will be started right away. And the reason for that, we have tried heparin in the first year of our program. And what we found is that we had a lot of peaks and troughs with the ACTs, anticoagulation, management was really difficult and then some of these patients develop it and they had antibodies and then we still had to switch to angiomax now angiomax is an expensive drug but our results which is approximately about between 78 to 80 percent success in our ecmo program we have that kind of success so it's actually a, a pretty good set of results for our small program and the duration of time that we've introduced this program in this hospital um, now, one of our perfusionists also um, recently, and I saw this in Europe, and I'm glad he instituted it. I give him full credit for it. Uh, because we can get into these rooms all the time and be in there all the time, what we did, we set up remote cameras on the cardio help, which is focused on the screen with all the displays. And we can, we have a remote um, unit on the outside with three cameras running on three ECMOs, which we can actually scroll and look at each one of those screens to see what is happening. So we can actually do rounds remotely rather than going into these rooms and coming out and causing cross-contamination. So I commended that perfusionist. I think he went out and bought it on his own, came in and mounted it. I was in the operating room and I saw him with this bag and he was looking kind of shifty. I didn't know what he was doing, but he did it. And so I, I applaud that and some people are doing that. I saw that in Europe. And I also heard some very strange things from Europe, which, caused, which I thought uh, was sorted out by the camera system. They are actually not instituting alarms on their, on their cardio helps and all that. They actually turned the, the alarms off so they don't have to go into the rooms. They're also looking at resources and cut off age, which I find fascinating. If they don't have a lot of resources, the cut off age is 60 years. 
if they have a lot of resources, they cut off ages six to five. That was fascinating in one of the webinar that I heard of. It's almost like titrating and um, basically uh, triaging medical care. But however, you do what you have to do in your situation. And I'm not going to uh, second guess that. Mr. Muhammad? Also, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. We were just, we were getting a little bit, little bit close on time. And I really appreciate your perspectives on DTIs and uh, heparin because that's been a constant source of feedback I've gotten in terms of perfusionists wanting to know which is the better choice. And we had a Michigan meeting previous to this and it was thought that they, it was agreed that DTIs are probably a better way to go just given the risk of uh, hit type two on prolonged heparin. Um, we're running a little bit short of time. You guys have so much experience and it sounds like you've got an incredible system down already. Would you be amenable to people contacting you? Um, I think the bit about the cameras is awesome. Would you be amenable to sites that are trying to set up like you where you've got the split COVID and non-COVID ECMO and get feedback and information from you down the road? Anytime. I'll, I'm available anytime for those questions, and they can talk to me anytime. Thank you. No, thank you, Haz. I appreciate it. Um, I want to. I want to list one last thing. We are scavenging also. Um, just got instituted this week. All exhaust um, gases off the off the cardio help or um, the oxygenator, and you would not believe it. On each twelve-hour shift, we get almost a half a pint of water in our collection. Uh, chamber and a vacuum, and that was all actually evaporating into the atmosphere, falling on probably a towel, and people were interpreting it as if, the, you know, uh, holding on to those things, not using gloves. It's, it's a very big problem. And so that scavenging is definitely working for us. So I want to add to that. Thank you. Thank you, Haas. I wanted to move on to Mike Freed from Henry Ford, Detroit. Uh, it's one of the, he's the chief perfusionist at one of the three big referral centers in Michigan. Um, Mike has some notoriety, a lot of perfusionists work in the background. He gained national notoriety last year when he was on national television as part of a team which did a double lung transplant on a young, young patient who had uh, suffered untoward sequela from vaping. Um, Mike's going to talk about redeploying and repurposing perfusionists in the age of COVID. Mike? Good afternoon. Welcome from uh, wintery Detroit. Um, I was asked to talk about deployment of perfusionists since Detroit was uh, one of the hardest hit areas and Henry Ford is part of the uh, Detroit area hospitals. Mm -hmm. At one point, we had close to a thousand patients in isolation, and when the COVID uh, pandemic started, we were told to prepare for 10 to 12 ECMOs running at any one time. When the hospital administration realized that this pandemic was worse in the Detroit area, they took a sw switch in the area that they were going and decided to curtail most of perfusion related activities, <clears throat> which meant that we would not put any patient with COVID on ECMO at this time. Uh, and we curtailed most of our elective surgeries. So then it became, what do you do with perfusionists? The first thing I decided to do was continue our schedule as normal, which we run with an N plus one with a minimum of two people per day. We still have a fairly active cath lab. They're still doing TAVRs and, and other stuff. And ECMO can be put on the uh, cath lab patients or any elect, not elective, but urgent emergent uh, open heart cases we're doing. Uh, at this point, we haven't put a patient on ECMO in a couple of weeks. As of today, I've been told that since the hospital is getting better and we are opening up more ICUs, that they will be considering starting putting patients on ECMO with COVID next week. That has been, hasn't been decided yet. So the plan was, is what do I do with the staff that I have when they're in there? Because most of the time when they're in there now, it's for backup. They're backing up the tavers, they're backing up the cat, uh, the uh, cath lab. And 
sitting around waiting for things to happen. Some of our tabbers, they're in there with pumps, but most of them, they're just a man available. Uh, <clears throat> so what I've decided to do is we, uh, everybody's been assigned or chose a project that they should be working on. I gave a list of projects that they could pick or they could pick their own. Uh, projects consist of, you know, cleaning pumps, maintenance of pumps, uh, all your equipment. Uh, when was the last time you did a thorough cleaning of your stuff, maintained your pumps, maintained your equipment. Uh, going through protocols and procedures, seeing what needs to be rewritten, updated, uh, surgeon's preference lists. Um, we're starting to have students come back at the end of this year. So having somebody write up new protocols and procedures for students' uh, expectations, uh, going through tubing packs, uh, specifications, all the protocols and procedures need to be updated. Our storeroom has been cleaned out, going through boxes and stuff for people saved over the years that we don't need or haven't been used in years. Uh, one of our perfusionists is looking at COVID uh, from the World Health Association and the CDC with recommendations on how to handle cleaning and writing up those protocols. Um, what other things? Uh, so basically, they're all. They, everybody has to have their own project, do their projects. Uh, I'm also doing, trying to do weekly or biweekly uh, virtual uh, meetings to go over the discussions of what they've been doing. Uh, any recommendations we can discuss of any protocols we want to change, and update. Some people have volunteered to go out and do some work in other areas, like uh, employee testing as they come in. Um, other than that, you know, the hospital has decided not to furlough any of the perfusions at this time, because as everybody feels that once this is done, we're going to have a surge of cases that have been backlogged and you need to have those personnel available. Uh, that's our experience and that's what we're doing at this time, uh, hoping to get back to normal, normalcy and you know, proceeding as we're going. Thank you, Mike, good luck. I know Detroit's in a bad place and uh, they're right behind New York and the West Coast in terms of the pandemic curve. Um, so I appreciate your, your ideas. Everybody wants to stay employed until we get back to business. Next, I wanted to introduce Linda, Ms. Linda Mangero. Uh, she's gonna discuss diagnosis and treatment of the cytokine storm and how that can be related to keeping, as Mike said, perfusionists gainfully occupied during this um, time. I should mention, I reached out to several perfusion leaders who would be the best person for this discussion and the unanimous choice was Linda. So I very much appreciate her being on this call and uh, taking this responsibility. Responsibility. So thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Can, you, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Do, do I have my slides, Kate? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just begin by thanking everyone for the invitation. Also thanking the other speakers, Haz and Mike, for their views and their experience. Uh, and I, I only have one disclosure, and that is that I haven't had the opportunity to actually use the site device. So started, uh, one thing that you should know as a disclosure from the company which is Cytosorbents, which is in Monmouth, uh, New, New Junction, New Jersey. Uh, it, the Cytosorb is a blood purification technology that treats cytokine storms specifically and other inflammation in critically ill patients. It has been granted authorization, emergency use of Cytosorb for use in patients with COVID-19. And um, uh, this is important because at least now we will be able to use it uh, in the United States. It's been used all over the world, um, but we haven't used it yet here. Next slide. 
Of course, um, cytokines are either anti-inflammatory or inflammatory. They're very small proteins that help stimulate and regulate the immune system. And they manage things like pain, fever, tissue repair, breakdown, and also blood cell production. Uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines that we're going to talk about today uh, uh, refer to a lot as specifically IL-6 and TNF and then IL-1, but there are many other cytokines. Uh, cytokines in vast excess uh, are called a cytokine storm and it can lead to massive uncontrolled systemic inflammatory uh, response syndrome. And macrophages from the initial inflammation are what actually activate a cytokine storm. Next slide. So examples of cytokines, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, are measured by a cytokine release assay, CRA. And as you can see to the right, the sort of cartoon explaining that you can see microphages release cytokines, well, so do other cells, endothelial cells, mast cells, granulocytes and lymphocytes. And in fact, many cells in the body produce cytokines, even other cytokines. So once you get uh, a cytokine storm, you, you really are in a perfect storm. Next slide, please. So this paper specifically deals with what they call the hyperferritinemic syndrome, which is a combination of four uh, really different kinds of shock, a macrophage, activation syndrome, a Stills disease, which is etiology unknown, septic shock, and then catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. And what they basically are saying in this paper is that very, very high ferritin levels in these clinical conditions are not, not just the product of inflammation, but rather has, has a pathogenic role. Um, and in an inflammatory environment, the huge levels of ferritin may be involved in some sort of loop mechanism where the ferritin's inflammatory properties are exacerbated, leading to an extreme expression of an additional inflammation mediators, and that's characteristic of a cytokine storm. Next slide. So the test to do, the immediate most inexpensive test that most laboratories have would be the serum ferritin test. Um, it's, it's, again, relatively inexpensive. Normal results are 24 to 336 uh, nanometers uh, per ml in males and 11 to 307 in women. Again, it's readily available and a very good first step for screening a uh, cytokine storm. And again, the other four forms that I alluded to before, the the mass, A, O, S, D, and CAPS and septic shock all have these complex feedback me mechanisms between ferritin and cytokines um, that control these uh, pro and inflammatory mediators. Next slide. So this is a in very interesting paper, very uh, el elaborate um, investigation. And basically what is happening here is there's an, an attack on the actual hemoglobin molecule, and that's the molecule, obviously, that carries CO2 and oxygen, removes CO2, and the lungs have extremely intense poisoning and inflammatory due to the inability to exchange these two uh, gases, and eventually this ends up in the, this ground glass opacities that you see in the lung on x-ray. Um, men have higher levels of hemoglobin, so they're more at risk, and children have low levels of, of ferritin, and they say that may be why children are protected from the COVID virus, but they can still be carriers. And then also you find very high levels of ferritin in diabetes, kidneys, and cardiovascular diseases, all the diseases that are sort of the comorbidities that have been um, 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 discussed in, in the COVID virus. Next slide. So this is what a cytokine storm looks like that eventually leads to acute respiratory distress syndrome. You can see that the microorganism on the left, either a virus or bacteria, gets through the epithelial cells and activates microphages, which in turn activate T cells and neutrophils. And this is where you get this necrosis and cytokine storm and eventually ends up uh, in the deep tissue of the lungs. Next slide. 
So the side absorb filter, which is what we're going to be talking about in the next few slides, is again the blood purification technology that has been used to treat cytokine storm uh, and deadly information, uh, inflammation in other critically ill individuals. It can treat lung failure, ARDS, septic shock leading to multiple organ dysfunction, and that's within the deep lung tissue uh, of the epithelium. Uh, and inflammation then leaks into the alveoli, and then finally you're ending up in systemic organ failure. And then it's almost too late. But um, if you identify a cytokine storm early and use cytosorb, it seems to be uh, helping. Next slide. The cartridge itself is filled with porous polymer uh, uh, beads, similar to grains of salt. And in the way it's designed, it's specific to allow small objects like electrolytes to pass through, to, to get trapped through it, but blood goes around the beads. And the appropriate, appropriately, excuse me, appropriately sized substances are captured and trapped inside the beads pores, which you hope is IL-6, IL-8, IL all the cytokines, and they are permanently removed from the blood. And then hydrophobic substances, such as cytokines and toxins, uh, are trapped. And this sweet spot for that is between five and 60 kilodaltons of molecular weight. Next slide. And you can see that this is showing um, a graph of the active cytokine sweet spot. And you can see it goes from six up until almost 70 uh, kilodaltons, but Next, uh, hit the slide two more times. Okay, good. IL-6 and tumor necrosis factor right there, right in the middle. And uh, when um, they're looking at removing these, it's almost 99% able to be removed. Next slide. There's also a European sepsis trial that had been going on. It was randomized and controlled, and it was a study of 78 patients. And the average patient had up to 20 total blood volumes treated, which in an in vitro hemoperfusion setting resulted in more than a 90% reduction in IL-6. And you can see on the chart on the right, uh, the different cytokines, the molecular weights, and, and the percent removal. And these findings were consistent with the ex vivo serum perfusion experiments that they've done on animals for removal of cytokines. Next slide. So uh, right now, Cytosorb has treated 80,000 patients in 58 countries. About two thirds of them have been critically ill patients in ICUs and the other third have been cardiac patients. Um, they, they tout that Cytosorb may be used very quickly. It's plug and play compatible with um, most commonly used blood purification machines such as hemoperfusion, hemodialysis, CRT and also ECMO machines and even cardiopulmonary bypass. Next slide. Uh, this is what the, um, the position of Cytosorb looks like for cardiopulmonary bypass. And basically it's like, a, to me, an ultrafiltration device where you take it and place it into a line that has positive pressure and send it back to a line with uh, a negative pressure. And so here it's going back to the reservoir and that's how you would use it during cardiopulmonary bypass would be, would be exactly like you'd use an, uh, an ultrafiltration device. Next slide. For, uh, for uh, if you were doing dialysis, which some perfusionists now are helping to do um, CVBH, CRT uh, dialysis in, in the ICUs to help out uh, the ICU staff, you, uh, you could, would place this pre-dialyzer. And you can see at the top of the screen here, it has the website for each, for the cytosorb therapy, and it gives you a step-by-step -step of exactly how to set the device up, how to prime it, and I would encourage anybody that's interested in using the device to go through the tutorials. They're, they're uh, very simple. And it, it, this, is, this is a no-brainer for perfusionists because this is what we do. Next slide. Then finally, we're looking at, this is what ECMO uh, would look like, how you would set it up in your ECMO circuit. And I did notice this morning, I was on the, uh, the webinar that took place um, in Italy. 
And um, I noticed that um, there was one slide where uh, they had added after the Cytosorb filter uh, an air bubble trap. They were calling a filter. Now I, I, I have to do some more investigation as to why that is used because normally we won't add little filters or, or air traps into our circuit, but I'm you know, wondering just myself is there has not been some problems with that and that's why they added it. And next slide, please. So um, one of the things that I wanted to say about the web webinar this morning was that um, there were 1,060 participants and uh, from all over the world. And the, uh, some of the take home points that I, that I sort of wrote down and want to report to you and that I don't have on a slide here is that it's recommended that um, you should use the device for 12 to 24 hours and then change the filter. And some use the filter for 24 hours each cartridge and then change the cartridge. Uh, you buy them in cases of six, which uh, cost $7,200, that's $1,200 each filter, which is really not that outrageous considering uh, what it can do. The blood flow, they recommend uh, usually 100 or 400 mLs. And they said that Sometimes after you do treatments for one or two days, on day seven, there is some kind of rebound and the cytokine level jumps back up again. So that maybe that's an, a, an opportune time to do an intervention and maybe another treatment. They also are saying, and, and we're seeing this with COVID you know, all over the world, that patients are hypercoagulable and they have severely elevated D-dimers and clotting is increased in the cartridge when it's lower flow. And they also suggest um, that you should keep the flow through the, the device over 200 mLs per minute. And um, you can measure IL-6 in re real time in some institutions. Uh, and the ferritin levels have been extremely high, indicating high systemic in inflammation. So to close, basically, it's within our scope of practice. We're already trained to perform ultrafiltration. Uh, and many perfusionists, again, are already deplo deployed to help out in the ICU doing CVDH. So I think that when we can get our hands on it, and there's a few institutions that have, and I don't know anybody that's started using it yet, um, but uh, it's a new technology, and it's something that's important for perfusionists to know how to run. And I think that uh, it, it should be in our armamentarium. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. That was, an, that, was an awesome, that was an awesome presentation. Everything from describing how the hemoglobin molecules attached, attacked by the virus, which goes a long way towards explaining the hypoxemia and hypercarbia, hypercarbia, hypercarbia we see. <laughs> Um, no, this is no, it was, that was perfect. I think perfusionists Good. can take that and go back to their surgeons and run with it. If I were on in the ICU up at Henry Ford, Detroit, I would ask that Mike get a couple of these and throw them in on me while I'm I'm on ECMO. So when I'm on to the Q and A portion of the webinar, where Joy Timpa, manager of perfusion and ECMO at Children's Hospital of Alabama in Hoover, Alabama, will be joining our presentation to assist in fielding. Uh, participants question. I will say the first question I saw got my attention because it talks about should AMSECT set up opinion or guidelines on transport of positive COVID-19 patients via hel helicopter on ECMO? Should this be done? And that got my attention because I've gotten three phone calls over the past three weeks uh, where sites realized retrospectively they had contaminated a huge number of their healthcare workers. This was their first attempt at doing ECMO and transporting patients on ECMO. And they realized that during the entire transport process, they hadn't been paying the same attention as they had previously. And so a half dozen to a dozen um, of their staff members had been contaminated during the transport process. So Joey, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, of course, I'd like to have some help from some of the adult guys. We haven't, we don't have many of uh, COVID patients right now, more employees than we do patients, of course, at the Children's 
hospital, but I know UAB uh, has a, a number of them and a number of them on ECMO. Um, as far as transporting, I don't think they are actively going after transports. I don't know what other centers are doing. Cincinnati just came after one of our kids, not that didn't have COVID, but for lung transplant evaluation, and they treated it just as if it had COVID with the N95 mask and everything. I would think there would be more risk in those tight quarters for that, and I don't know if that's a good idea at the moment. I also know that in our center, we're not going actively going after um, organs out of state, only in-state organs. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are doing that as well. Carla, had you collated the queue, the questions? What, what other questions are out there? I'm looking through them now. Linda, I was going to ask um, also, I saw some of those, um, that webinar, but, uh, you know, some of these patients are just hypercapnic, and I wonder if um, this is something I've seen my Italian colleagues and South American people, uh, perfusionists, do over the years because of lack of resources, but adding an oxygenator to a CRT machine with the cytosorb, I wonder how beneficial, I know there's also hypercoagulable issues that you'd have to monitor that but and maybe uh, have higher flows but i think especially with resource limitation that may be an option yeah they uh you, you know if you, you saw some of those pictures like the they had the picture of the uh the liver when they didn't get to the patient quick enough and the liver was completely clotted uh, and it was you know that was very interesting and everybody's experiencing almost the same thing and i think that um, you know, the use of cytosorb definitely needs to be explored. And most people haven't been using it because they said there, there's no information, there's no data. But it looks like today there was plenty of data. And one thing that they didn't share was you know, sort of outcomes. And that may be because the patient doesn't have an outcome yet. They may be still in the hospital and it's early. So, but um, it's good to know that a lot of people around the, around the world actually are using it. If possible, I was looking at the q and I saw Fred Hill from New York, uh, NYU, and he said they've used it in eight cytosorb patients. Um, Great. Is there, any, is there any way Fred can be put on here and discuss that? Because um, I get a lot of questions about just what the logistics of it are. And as you said, Linda, um, many of the surgeons at our surgeons meeting say, well, it hasn't been proven. Well, at this point, there hasn't been a whole lot of proven therapies for COVID-19 to begin with. Correct. Um, so can Fred be enabled just to give us his feedback or insights? I see him on here. You know, while we're waiting, I also like to, Linda, that um, the markers uh, saying that put in, putting them on early is more beneficial and some places in Europe are still, they're testing IL-6, which most people don't have access to, but. Uh, monitoring your CRP and your ferritin levels would be good indicators of when to um, uh, start the hemofiltration. Yeah, for sure. And ferritin is a dirt cheap test. As a veterinarian, we've been using that on horses since the early early 20th century. So it's compared to an IL-6 test, it's a uh, it's pennies for on the dollar. Mm -hmm. Red, are you available? It looked like he was. He muted. Okay, mm. sorry about that. Fred, if you can come on, just, just talk. Okay. Oh, he doesn't have a mic. There we go. Okay. <laughs> you know, Richard Owens also in uh, Texas, uh, I remember us talking about he had, I think he's on uh, one of the participants, but he had an experience with a hypoplastic left heart patient that was uh, post-cardiotomy and, and ECMO, and uh, they had compassionate use for a cytosorb, and it worked well for them. Great. I saw the question, uh, does this device actually provide better outcomes? Per the meeting this morning, it certainly, certainly suggested that. Now, I know the plural of antidote is not data, um, but again, if at this point, if it was me, from what I've seen, I would, I would want one of these if I was in an ICU. And do, would you agree, Linda? I, 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 agree. I agree right now with, from, from what I've learned, 
I, I think, you know, yes. And uh, again, yes, it has to be studied more, but we also just, it, it, this is a perfect opportunity to, to be able to use this when we have such sick people to see whether or not it can actually, you know, work. And I think that it, it would be important to do. And I think people are gonna, you know, what, I mean, it's only a week now that they've given us this opportunity to use it for COVID. Before that, it was, uh, you know, really investigational, only compassionate use, and and um, you had to uh, have IRB approval. So all of that is is you know passed by the wayside. And now, if a, phys a treating physician wants to order it, they can. I saw an interesting question that's come up at several of the Michigan meeting meetings. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to read it real quickly. I'd like to get people's feedback. It says, we're a small community hospital because of our real nature. We fill a void for ECMO initiation and transport, transport to an ECMO center, presumably like Henry Ford, Detroit. Our plan for a COVID-19 patient would be to put them on an ECMO and then transfer them to an ECMO center. I'm concerned about staff contamination in the ambulance. So can you speak more about the importance of scavenging and also maybe address the concern about ET tube cuff leaks, pending of the ventilator circuit um, while in transport? And I just the initial, just before whoever wants to answer that, one concern we had at our Michigan meetings is as the referral centers like Mike's get full, should outlying centers start taking up ECMO? And the consensus was, if you don't have protocols in place and if you don't have experience with this, this is probably, your COVID-19 patient is probably not a good place to start learning how to effectively apply ECMO to patients. Uh, that your outcomes are probably not going to be great and you run a real risk of contaminating your staff. That's not me. That was just feedback I've gotten. So does anybody want to, else want to discuss uh, that question, which has been fairly topical? Has your, has your mute, mute, you're muted. You got to unmute yourself. Well, I, I don't think that they should tackle, um, they should tackle ECMO when, when there's centers that haven't done them before. I don't think they should do it on a regular basis. They should send them to larger centers other than having some type of rescue ECMO. Why reinvent the wheel when there's big centers who are doing a good job at it and send them to those centers after they rescue them with a, some type of um, ECMO device. But, um, and I think that's usually the spoken hub process that most centers have. In this situation, um, I still don't think it's a good idea, but if, um, the resources and their ability and, and their experience would probably limit them. So Cytosorb would be a, a, a good use of that. And there is also another uh, filter like Cytosorb. I don't want to just use Cytosorb by name. Okay, so I have a phone call coming in here from Fred Hill and he's going to be on my speaker phone and hopefully it will broadcast through the webinar. Let's see if it works. Okay, Freddie, go ahead. Can you hear him? No. no. Oh, you can't hear him? Yeah, that's pretty quiet. Uh, okay, Freddie, doesn't work. I think we have a speaker Sorry, for next guys. week. But anyway, you can give out my information, they can email me on. Okay. All right, Freddie, I'll talk to you soon. He said that he, uh, you can, we, anybody can email him if they want to. I'd like to also mention that, you know, this is, this time is ripe for the, the FDA is release people in uh, companies to FDA approve on emergency use. And there's, um, you know, Spectrum has their centrifugal pump that's come, that is uh, available now. Uracets auctionators have been available for a, a uh, few months that we've used, uh, really like, um, you know, McKay's had some supply issues. So having all these alternatives are, um, are, are good and perfect timing. One, one last question, if you don't mind, which has come up repeatedly and I saw here, should we transport, and I'd put this to Mike and Haas since you're both big referral centers, should we transport on ECMO or just transport the, transport the COVID-19 patient off ECMO and institute ECMO at the receiving facility? What would be your opinions on that, Mike and Haas? Well, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, we just had a first transfer into our hospital and we transferred on a mechanical ventilator and we placed them on ECMO in our hospital. I, I would not uh, suggest that people be transferred, if COVID patients, sorry, 
to be on ECMO because of the logistics problem, which is scavenging, which is cross-contamination, infection, spreading of it, the rest of it. And um, so that's my take on it. I agree also. I think that they should be transported in and the receiving hospital may have other techniques of ventilation that they'll try first and maybe not need to put the patient on ECMO. And that's what happened to our patient. We, we, that patient was on an ECMO watch for two days until they finally start to decompensate. And they were doing well and probably would not have gone on ECMO, but then finally took a turn for the worse. See, like you said, the, the bugs attack the hemoglobin mo uh, mo molecule. And basically these patients stay in a, in a ferrous state and they can't pick up oxygen. Their curve is down to the right and they just can't pick up oxygen so they can't unload also. There's nothing to load and there's nothing to unload. And that's the problem. Hence the ferritin and the whole works. Uh, big paper in that. Well, thank you everyone. We're at an hour. Um, we have over 400 attendees. I think this was very valuable to practitioners. It would be if I was still pumping cases. Um, thanks for to joining today's webinar. There'll be a recording of this webinar and it'll be posted on the joint task force uh, site within two days. And all the attendees of the live broadcast will receive access to a brief survey to claim credit for your participation. If your question wasn't addressed today, please join the discussion on the COVID-19 Joint Perfusion Task Force website. And please feel free to post your questions and dis on the discussion forum um, from other perfusionists and around the world are checking those on a daily basis. So I thank everybody for attending and I appreciate your patience and uh, I hope to see you all next week as well. Thank you. Take care. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.